So this video is going to show you how to run some chi-squared in SPSS. And the examples we're going to do today, we're going to do two chi-squareds. One's going to be a 2 by 2 chi-squared and another's going to be a 2 by 3 chi-squared. It's going to be on very similar data. Also at the end of the video, I'll put some information on how you can get effect sizes for your chi-squared and you can skip along to that if that's just what you're interested in by clicking on the link here. So for the, this data set, I'll just quickly run through what we've got. So what we're going to be looking at today, we've got a diagnosis variable, and this is people with no diagnosis, or people with a clinical diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. So that's one, there can be one of two categories there, no diagnosis or diagnosis. And then we've got amphetamine use is our other category, and we've got non-users versus user, users of amphetamine. And both measures are labeled as nominal categorical variables in one category or the other. If you wanted to, we could click on that, that here, which would actually put the labels into the spreadsheet. It doesn't have any effect on your data in any way whatsoever. No analyses change. I usually just leave things numerical. So if we're going to run a chi-squared, it's a relatively straightforward procedure in SPSS. We just simply get to analyze descriptive statistics. And then we select cross tabs, which just means cross tabulation. And this is our cross tabs window. And this is basically we just tell it how we want to set up our output. We've got number of rows in the table and columns in the table. And you can pop these either way around that you wish. So in this example here, we'll just ask for rows can be diagnosis and our columns so across the top of the table will be amphetamine use diagnosis will be down the side of the table as a label you can click on statistics then and this gives us a range of different things that we ask for and um, all we're going to ask for here today is going to be a chi-squared statistic later on i will show you about getting effect sizes but just for now i'm going to keep the output simple so we can click continue then the next thing we can click on is cells this gives us an option to put lots of different types of information into our table. We don't really need to look at a lot of these things in this video. We're only going to really look at these things here, counts and percentages. I'm just going to show you this. So this is what our cross tabulation would look like. So we've got amphetamine use, non-user user. Diagnosis, no diagnosis, paranoid schizophrenia. So, in this col in this area of the table here, these are going to be people with no diagnosis and non-users. This is people with paranoid schizophrenia, but non-users. These are amphetamine users with no diagnosis, and these are people with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, and they are also a user as well. So. This is the default, this is tick, this is reserved. This is just going to tell us exactly the number of people within our data set who fall into each category. So the observed data. So it's going to tell us the exact number of people who do not use amphetamine, who have no diagnosis, who do not use amphetamine, but do have a diagnosis and so on. We could, could click expected. This is the all being even how many people would we expect in each category? And it's actually what the chi-squared statistic is actually based on. It's not a useful thing that you never really report them. What is more useful are the percentages. Because this gives us sort of a neater way of looking at the data. If we ask for the row percentages, the row percentages would give us the percentage of people who have no diagnosis and who are non-users, and the percentage of people who are no diagnosis who were users of amphetamine. Likewise, if we ask for the column percentages, this just does it the other way around. So it'll give you the percentage of non-users with no diagnosis, and the percentage of non-users with paranoid schizophrenia, and then it would do it for this as well. Total would simply give us an additional column at the end of our cross-tabulation, which would tell us the total number of people with, here would be the total number of people with no diagnosis, the column here would be the column here in this sector here would give us the total number of people with paranoid schizophrenia, and then the column total here 
would be the total number of people who are non-users and the total number of people of users. And the little there'd be a little sector here, which would just be 100% of the sample. It's often quite useful just to look at these, and I will tick them both, all three of them, just to show you what the output looks like. However, when we report them in tables, I tend to just choose one of the percentages to report, otherwise it's, the table just gets quite dense. So what we'll select is both rows, column and total. Click continue, and then we can click OK. This will give us our cross tabulation output. Case processing summary is a standard for everything we have. Um, basically, it's the number of individuals in this data set, 50 people, and that represents 100% of the data. There's no missing data at all. We don't really need to look at that or interpret it too much. Now, this is our cross tabulation table here, and this breaks down our data quite clearly. So, what we can we see in this table? Well, in this table, we can see that there is 19 individuals with no diagnosis who are non-users. There are 10 individuals with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia who are non-users. There are six individuals who are users on vitamin but with no diagnosis. And 15 individuals who are users on vitamin and also have a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. If you look at the totals, what we can see is there's 25 people with no diagnosis in this sample and there's 25 people with a diagnosis of split 50-50 in this sample. If you look at amphetamine use in the sample, however, we can see 29 people never used amphetamine and 21 people have used amphetamine. And overall, we've got 50 individuals in the sample. As I say for the percentages, so this is the count within diagnosis. So 76% of the individuals within no diagnosis and non-users, 24% of people within no diagnosis are users. Within the paranoid schizophrenia group, 40% of them are non-users, 60% are users. So if we look at the columns instead, what you can see is, so the percentage within amphetamine use, so within the non-users, 65.5% have no diagnosis, 34.5% have a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Within the users, 28.6% have no diagnosis, 71.4% do have a diagnosis. So, as I said before, generally speaking, uh, it can be quite a messy table if you put too many percentages in. And so I tend to just do one set. People can work on percentages independently if they want. So one percentage, is, one percentage tends to get the points across quite clearly. Um, I would keep the totals in. I think the totals can actually be quite useful because you can see how the data is split up. Generally speaking, so how many amphetamine users and there are and how many non-users there are. So as a descriptive statistic, that's relatively useful as well. And you can produce a table. It's not too far off this table, but of course, just make sure you remember, it's got to be APA formatted, so we're going to have no vertical lines in the table at all, and only a limited number of horizontal lines, but you can still explain and show all the information easy without these additional lines in it at all. The other thing that we can write up as well is the actual chi-square squared statistic as well which comes from this table below. So this chi-squared statistic will tell us if we've got there's a significant imbalance between the groups. This is basically a comparison between the actual observed data and expected data, the all being even data. And basically as we know the critical level of statistical significance for good or bad is a probability of less than 0.05 you can see in this case our p-value is 0 0.01 so we've got a statistically significant chi-squared statistic and we'd write that up just like this and you could say something like there's a statistically significant association between amphetamine use and diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia and then you can refer your reader to the table below as well 
So this is a very simple chi squared test. However, we can have a more complicated chi squared sign. You could have a three by three, a four by five, and go on and on and larger and larger. Of course, you need more individuals the larger your data set would get. So I'm just going to show you now a quick run through of a two by three chi squared. This is now a two by three chi squared we're going to be looking at. Basically, um, the data is very similar. Diagnosis remains exactly the same. No diagnosis versus paranoid schizophrenia. Amphetamine is now got a bit more subtlety to it. Non-user used occasionally, and then addicts are people addicted to amphetamine use. And if, again, if you wish, we could change that so you can see how the variables fall out. So in this chi-square, just to show you what this would look like, this is what this chi-square would look like now. So it's now a 2 by 3, because we've got this additional level to it, the occasional users. So we've got occasional users with no diagnosis and occasional users with paranoid schizophrenia. So now, as you can see, we've got six cells that our participants could possibly fall into, rather than four, which is how many we had in the previous example. So to analyse this, we just follow the same process, analyse the scripted statistics, and then we go to cross tabs, diagnosis, amphetamine use. As for our statistics, we'll go for our chi-squared again, cells, I'll put in all those information just like last time again. And then we click OK. So this is the output for the 2 by 3 chi-squared. You can see it's very similar to the other one, as much as we want diagnosis. No diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia and amphetamine use. And now we've got this additional column for used occasionally. So what can we see from this? So within people with no diagnosis, 60% of those are non-users, 28.6% are used occasionally, and 11.4% were amphetamine addicts. And you add those three up, and you get 100% of the sample. Now, if you look at within those diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, you can see what well, 25% had never used amphetamine, 14 or 35% used amphetamine occasionally, and 16 or 40 percent of them were amphetamine addicts and of course that adds up to 100 percent if we look at it the other way around so within non-users of amphetamine 67.7 percent had no diagnosis and 32.3 had a diagnosis and they used occasionally 41.7 percent had no diagnosis 58.3 did Within the addict group, 20% of them were no diagnosis and 80% of them were paranoid schizophrenia. Again, if we look to our Pearson chi-squared, we can see we've got a statistically significant association between amphetamine use and diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, and we write that up accordingly. And our table for writing this up, which just looks something like this, so very similar to our table before. As I said before, it can be quite complicated to have lots of percentages in. You can do it, you just simply add another set of lines to the data if you want, but this table gives quite a lot of information already and the reader can pretty much interpret what's happening in your data quite easily with this information. So this part of the video is just going to show you how to produce effect sizes for chi-squared. There's a few different effect sizes it produces and it depends upon the type of contingency table you have, whether it's a 2x2 two two design or not, essentially. And when we have a 2x2 two two design, like in this example here, this is the first example we looked at, we have diagnosis, no diagnosis or paranoid schizophrenia versus amphetamine use of user and non-user. Um, we produce a statistic called phi, which is just a Greek letter, it looks something like this. Um, in order to produce that statistic, it's relatively straightforward. We get to analyze descriptive statistics and cross tabs. We just set up our chi square just as we did before. When we go to statistics, we also ask for phi and Kramer's V. We click continue. Then we click OK. And it gives us this output. This is the same output as you got before. I just simply haven't asked for anything additional in that table percentage wise, but this is what we're interested in here. And this is the fee statistic here. And the 
the useful thing about phi is it's the equivalent of a correlation r, the correlation coefficient r, Pearson's correlation. Um, so we can just report this on the end of our sentence when we're writing up our chi-squared and we just add phi equals and in this case we'd write 0.37 to interpret this does you may see different interpretations of the fact sizes generally speaking what we're looking at is a value of 0.1 is considered small 0.3 medium effect and 0.5 and above would be considered a large effect size for this so in this case we're looking at a medium effect size if we were to look at our other chi-squared example this is where we had amphetamine use was a bit different because we have non-user addict and used occasionally so it's a two by three design we don't report the fee statistic instead we report crane as v now a lot of the time you're going to get this, exactly the same figure but you interpret crane as v differently Kramer's V is a very, very similar, similar formula. The difference between the two formulas is simply that the degrees of freedom is taken into account when you're calculating Kramer's V. Um, and also, when you interpret it, it the, side, the effect size is interpreted according to the, the degrees of freedom as well. So it's not a simple case of it being bigger than a certain number means medium effect large effect and so on it is actually based upon how many degrees of freedom there are in your chi-squared table so if we were just to produce a statistic again set up just as before click continue and here we go this is the statistic report Kramer's V here and we've got this Kramer's V of 0.391. As I say, we interpret this according to the degrees of freedom in the model in our Pearson's chi squared. So in this case, we have a degree of freedom of 2. So this table shows you how to interpret different Kramer's V values. So if we look at the row with a degree of freedom of 2 and we look at our statistic, well, we can see actually that this statistic produced in our table, 0.39, is actually bigger than what we call like a cutoff for a large effect in Kramer's V, which is 0 0.35. So we could write this up at the end of our sentence when we write up the chi-squared and simply add in this additional Kramer's V equals 0.39. We can basically say from this we've got a large effect in our data.